I've been singing since before I can remember. There's like home videos of me singing when I was like two, just putting on a show. I always wanted to be on stage. I just can't wait to be kidding. Yeah. yeah. It brings me joy, like just performing the whole rest of the day after my shows. I'm just like so excited for the rest of the day. It just gives me some sort of like energy. Just being on stage has just always been my favorite thing. She just has this love and compassion for people and that shines through when she sings. And so it's just such a joy to watch her worship um, as she leads Southbrook students. Spring of my freshman year, I woke up with like a lump in my neck and I gradually started feeling more and more tired and just like sick all the time. And like I kept, I went to the doctor probably once or twice a month and I never got any answers. A couple weeks later, my dad got the call that I had thyroid cancer. When I found out that Brenna had cancer, I think that was probably one of the scariest things for me. Brenna's not just one of the girls in my small group, but she's also like a daughter and has her entire life ahead of her and she gets cancer right in a place that she is afraid will take all of that away from her. We um, were referred to a, um, an ENT like surgeon and she was like, um, I hate to like tell you this, but the um, like the one risk of the surgery is that it like ruins a lot of people's voices for speaking, let alone for singing. Not only am I fighting this disease, but I'm also dealing with like having the one thing that I loved so much being taken out of my life. There was a very real fear that she would come out of surgery and not be able to sing again. And so as a group, um, we prayed for her So the day of the surgery was actually on my last day of my junior year, so I missed my last day. When everyone was getting ready for summer and I was getting ready for this like life-changing thing to happen, it could ruin my life, it could save my life, we didn't know at the time. But on the day of her surgery, I got to go and have prayer with her. And one of the most amazing things that I'll never forget, and I know that Brenna will never ever forget, is that as we prayed, her surgeon prayed as well. And her surgeon prayed that God would guide her hands and that God would help her to save Brenna's vocal cords. So the surgery that was supposed to be four hours, it was eight hours long because she wanted to make sure that everything was done perfectly to take care of my voice. And um, she ended up sewing my vocal nerves back together after they fell apart to try to get them to be preserved as much as possible. And then the next day, went up to see her at the hospital and she was already able to speak, uh, which was nice because she, was, she didn't know for sure if she would be able to do that. And at that point, we still didn't know if I could sing yet. And so I, um, I just sang a little line of something and my mom just started sobbing. She's like, I never thought I'd hear you sing again. It was um, very like emotional just knowing that like, um, that I was not going to have to lose something that I thought was going to be like the end of having to ever be able to sing again. My story is being written by the best author there is, so I just think that um, I can trust it no matter if I don't like what's happening or not because it's just always going to be in the best hands possible. So. And so while it was super scary, it was also just watching her as an adult looking at this teenager and saying, wow, I need to have the faith like that in everything I do as well. I keep my dirt on the surface so you don't gotta dig. People that make me nervous try to hide all their sins and I got no reason cover my tracks the best part of learning is just to love you where you're at so love where you're at oh love where you're at keep your dirt on the surface and just love you where you're at 
And I'll be where you're at Hold you just the way you're at <laughs> Could you hear how Debbie and Brenna had this experience through her journey and what it meant to Brenna to hear prayer, to be prayed with and to be prayed for? Stories like that, events like that, and what Brenna can celebrate now that people have walked through that journey with her. That's events and stories and prayer. Uh, and our heart as the community of Southbrook um, participating in God's movement is to be engaging each other with connection and community. Uh, and I love being able to share stories like that with you, uh, let alone to hear Brenna's amazing voice. Uh, and this is for this reason is why we participate uh, in generosity, not just because um, we know that generosity changes us when we say, God, you are my greatest treasure, but also because of what we get to participate in uh, and, and seeing change and things move uh, and, and hearing stories and being there for each other. Uh, so church, participate with us in push pay. You can download the app or check out the link that uh, is commented in the Facebook live field if you're watching there uh, and participate in generosity with us. We're going to sing about how there's nothing else like God. And uh, in this moment, you might be in your kitchen, you might be in your car, you might be outside on a park bench or walking. And try as much as you can to give your undivided attention to why God deserves those songs for us to sing about Him and what effect that they have on us as we give our attention to Him. Yeah. 
We live in an era where efficiency has a great value with systems and processes and procedures. For some, efficiency uh, is valued even at the expense of other things that have value. It's interesting to me that some of the moments that have been most meaningful in my life with friends and family have been when I am the least efficient. You could say that Jesus was inefficient. And maybe he would even find that as a compliment. He seemed to kind of wander from A to B. He would stop at one town while someone else wanted him to stop at another. And then he would eventually get there. He never is uh, depicted as running in the Gospels. And he picked a, a team of disciples that had some of the most underwhelming credentials. It doesn't appear as though efficiency was his greatest value. There's a story in the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, which if anything, that tells us that God really cared about this moment so much that he didn't want us to miss it. It's like you put the photos that you want people to see, you hang them on your wall. God said, I'm hanging this on my wall. And it's where Mary, a friend of Jesus's, at a dinner party, takes an alabaster jar, some scripture passages say it's a verse, a vase, and she just breaks it open and she pours it on his feet, which for us, it would kind of look like opening up a bottle of wine and throwing the cork away and saying, I'm spending this whole bottle of wine. I'm enjoying it. I'm spending it with just you and just me. So in this moment, the disciples see how inefficient this is, how uncalculated, maybe how reckless it is to take something that had so much value, maybe even an, a year's worth of wages. She broke it and put it on his feet. And then Jesus says to the disciples, leave her alone. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, her action will be told in memory of her. And I think it's because the same attitude that King David had when he was offered an altar to be pre-built for him before he made a sacrifice and he said, no, I'm not going to give God a gift that doesn't cost me something. That there's a value to taking something that could be productive for yourself or maybe even for others and to say, I'm going to give this attention and this focus to God. So you might be in your kitchen, you might be driving your car, uh, you might be in your living room, and you can take that attention and this time that you're spending right now and it can look like you breaking a vase, breaking the alabaster jar, spending this breath that you could spend doing anything else and saying, I'm giving it to you. Nothing else matters, not even my own agenda. It's about you. I just want you and nothing else and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want
So back in the 80s, the Chicago Bears had a great team, or so they tell me. They had super players like Walter Payton and Jim McMahon, and these players recall a story when at the very beginning of the season, they're all gathering in the chapel, and just as the chaplain is explaining to the team that he wants one of them to pray the Lord's Prayer out loud for all of them to join in, William Perry, the defensive lineman known as the Fridge, is walking into the chapel. So Jim, the quarterback, takes the opportunity and he leans towards the chaplain and he says, I'll bet you 50 bucks the fridge doesn't know the Lord's Prayer. At which point, the chaplain, who's a pure, upright, holy man, completely accepts Jim's uh, little game. And so they sit down and the fridge begins to pray. As I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And Jim, the quarterback, just starts shaking his head. And he slides his hand in his pocket and grabs a $50 bill and says, Man, I was sure the fridge didn't know the Lord's Prayer. And he handed it over to the chaplain, and the chaplain just smirked. So even though both of those guys didn't know the Lord's Prayer, I guarantee you that they're impacted by people that did. The Lord's Prayer uh, is this moment where Jesus is teaching us how to pray And he's explaining his plan for the movement and how we behave as people that have pledged to say, I am following Jesus. I want to live like him. It goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So Father in heaven, Jesus was the first Jew to have ever prayed to Yahweh or God in heaven as that intimate parent relationship. And then when he says heaven, we lose in translation that it actually means heavens. So for them in their time, there are three different atmospheres, and it meant that God was not just with the sun, the moon, and the stars, or up in the clouds, but he was also as close as our next breath. And when he says, hallowed be your name, it means let us respect and enjoy who you are and your personality. And then this is part of the mission that your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, your kingdom, that phrase is a little bit antiquated for us. We don't think about kingdoms very much. Uh, And I think that Dallas Willard wraps up this idea and adapts it pretty easily for us. He says, kingdom is really the range of your effective will, where what you want to be done can be done. So a bunch of us have our own little kingdoms where in my home, uh, my wife and I can, can make things that we want to happen actually happen. So Jesus is saying that we want to be people that are helping what God is having done in heaven also be done here. And so this is where, uh, you know, throughout the rest of the New Testament, Paul and some other writers talk about these 59 one another's because Jesus says, the world will know me and they will know that you're following me by the way that you love one another. You will love as I have loved you. So these 59 one another's are not, rules. They're more descriptors for us as we say and move throughout the world. This is what we should be like. And so the, the one another I get to talk to you all about uh, is from Ephesians 5.19. I want to just take a moment to say uh, I've heard the phrase before, uh, I hate singers who preach and preachers who sing. And I get the opportunity as a singer to preach to you about singing. See, unthinkable. Uh, And it comes from Ephesians 5.19, where uh, we encounter one of these one another's. And it goes like this, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit. Some translations say spiritual songs. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And I think it's important, again, that we kind of adapt the language here. So uh, what we read when we read, be filled with the Spirit, is this idea of the with God life. And then rather, instead of saying that we are speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, communicating to each other. Now, uh, they're kind of like these three different descriptors. Some people will translate them as arbitrary, and others say, no, they're distinct. And it goes, uh, you know, to say that maybe the Psalms, we can speculate, were songs to God. Hymns are songs about God and His qualities. And then spiritual songs 
are about us moving through the world with God, partnering with us when we face challenges uh, and new experiences. And then when we say that we want to give thanks to God uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and make music from our heart, we're saying with sincerity and with gratitude. So to wrap it all up again, it's about having the with God life, with God life and one another, communicating using songs to God, about God, and with God, using sincerity in our hearts and expressing our gratitude. We can't talk about what worship really is and how it's connected to singing and really all of our actions and behaviors without referencing this instance where Jesus meets the woman at the well. Eric talked about that a little bit last week uh, and accepting one another. And part of this acceptance is the agape love where you can't just love God and not love others. You, they're inseparable. You have to love others if you love God and vice versa. And so when it comes to loving God, what does this look like? Jesus says in John 4, 24, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So let's go to this word truth. Uh, I've kind of broken it down to these five different aspects that singing uh, in, in captures for us. It goes like this. T, the first letter of truth, is training. So sometimes we sing songs uh, and other times they sing us. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, we sing about God's character and our commitment and desire to be transformed. Uh, but sometimes we sing these songs and we aren't what we're singing. But we are singing about what we desire to be, how we desire to be changed. Uh, the Augustine says that the person who sings prays twice. So there's this unique connection that you can't really put your finger on about just really how um, singing engages the body and the mind and the heart. Dr. Daniel Levitin is a professor of psychology and behavioral neuroscience at McGill University. He's this author of a, a book called This Is Your Brain on Music. And he talks about how the science behind singing, that singing actually lowers your cortisol and relieves stress and tension and feelings of loneliness. He says that studies have shown that when people sing, endorphins and oxytocin are released by the brain, which in turn lowers stress and anxiety levels. Oxytocin is a natural hormone that enhances feelings of trust and bonding, which also explains why people report um, that they improve their levels of depression and loneliness, and they feel more connected to other people when they sing. The next letter in this truth uh, is remembering. So there's a power to how singing has an effect on the brain. Uh, in Alzheimer's societies, there are many kind of singing for the brain programs. You might have encountered a person who is in you know, a later version of dementia, yet somehow they can maintain memories and little jingles and songs that they've encountered over the years, even though they might be missing some details uh, that you would assume would be really valuable in life. So when we think about this idea of remembering, uh, it also points me back to this idea that we don't become our new selves uh, because we're trying to look for what our new selves should be, but we become our new selves when we look to God. So every time we remember God and His character and what He's like, that's resetting that target. It's the renewing of our minds and saying, remember, this is who you said you wanted to be. In Colossians 3, 15 through 17, it's known as the sister verse for the verse that we're talking about today. In Ephesians 5, it says that um, the church and the people in the church should be teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So a little bit different of a language, uh, but it's really, in this passage, use, leveraging singing as a tool to create unity. So it goes like this, God be the decider. Teaching and admonishing doesn't mean that you're correcting people, but it says we want God to be the umpire who's going to settle the disputes between us, just like there are umpires in Greek culture that were settling disputes between Olympic athletes. And then a few weeks ago, Laura Buffington shared this idea from Psalm 107 on unity, that when we, we uh, have this way that God makes all of our stories converge together. Psalm 107 goes like this. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. And let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. 
those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from all the lands. It says that these, these people were uh, coming from the temple through the desert. Some came from the temple out of prison. Some came off of their sick beds. Some from wandering at sea. Some were caught in storms. Yet they all had made their way to the temple. I want to read to you uh, another thought from C.S. Lewis. He has this awesome book called Church Music, which has really shaped me as, as a person uh, who's leading songs in the church. It goes like this. When I first became a Christian about 14 years ago, I thought I could do it on my own by retiring to my rooms and reading theology. I would not go to church. I disliked very much their hymns, which I considered to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. I feel that way sometimes, too. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came across different people of quite different outlooks and different educations. And then gradually, my conceit just began to peel off. I realized that the hymns being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic boots on the opposite pew. And then you realize that you aren't fit to clean those boots. And it gets you out of your solitary conceit. There's this unifying effect when we are singing together. And there's a physical dimension to this too, which is so fascinating to me. Um, Published in the Frontiers of Neuroscience is this article where they took uh, a study room and while they were singing songs, they monitored their heart rate. Um, Bjorn Vikoff says that when you sing the phrases, it is a form of guided breathing. So we're all inhaling and exhaling at the same time. And it says when you exhale, the heart slows down. So everyone's heart rates were slowing down together. But then what really struck him is that it took almost no time, just maybe a few stanzas, and all of the singer's heart rates had become synchronized. This readout of pulse monitors that were just jumbled, jaggled lines, they became a series of uniform peaks all together, and their heart rates fall into the shared rhythm guided by the song's tempo. And then as followers of Christ, our, our heart rates and our, our mind's desires are even guided by uh, the rhythms and the lyrics uh, of these songs about God and about His people. And telling. After unity, we have telling. Uh, there's this contagious and interesting effect when people sing, not just about you know, any topic, but especially God. See, the very breath that a human needs to survive when it's being inhaled but then turning that breath around and not using it for yourself, but instead exhaling it back to God. Uh, the story of the conversion of the prison guard when Paul and Silas are trapped in the prison. And in this moment, they're singing like they're losing. There might be some of you uh, who in the song just before, uh, you might be singing like you're losing or you might be singing like you're going through something. And this was Paul and Silas when they're stuck in prison. And as you know, there's this amazing conversion of the prison guard. And I can only think about how uh, when Paul and Silas were singing these hymns about who God is and his faithfulness to them, even in a prison, how contagious and how interesting that was for that prison guard. I want to read to you one last quote from C.S. Lewis. And he explores the psychology behind... um, how when we express, when we tell about this good news, uh, that it it completes the enjoyment. C.S. Lewis says it is the appointed consummation. It is the process of being worshipped that God communicates His presence to men. I love what Richard Rohr says. He says um, that we don't invite God's presence, we just become more aware of it. And in this key point for Lewis, the command to praise is not just so that God can receive something, but it's about how God gives himself when we think and when we talk about him. And lastly, uh, I want to talk to you about honoring. So you see, we've come through training, remembering, unity, telling, and honoring to complete how we worship in spirit and in truth The reality is that God doesn't need our songs. He's so much bigger than soliciting flattery. He's not dependent on that. 
Um, but he knows that one of the best things that we can do for us is to think about him. If you're going to miss anything in this teaching, the main thing I want you to hear is this, that maybe one of the best things that we can do for each other is think about him. That's where this speak to one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If our minds and hearts are guided with this idea of, of this benevolent God, who in John 3, 16, gave himself, this generous, benevolent God, if that is at the forefront, then we cannot help but be shaped by that and have that lens when we interact with each other. One of the best things that you can do for you and for others is think about God. Now, as a, as a worship leader, uh, I've always struggled with this idea that I'm on a stage in bright lights uh, and I'm like kind of pointing to God, but in a way saying, you know, have, have access to these ideas or these lyrics or melodies with me. Uh, and, and until I, I came across this metaphor of worship leading or even teaching is like being a curator in an art gallery. The attention is never about the curator. The attention is about the art, but the curator has to be passionate and skillful in the way that they facilitate the right questions uh, to provoke thoughts in the viewer for them to consider about how this changes their experience or maybe the way that they perceive the world. So in a way, uh, I think about my role as a pastor and a song leader, as a curator to all of these amazing galleries of God and these stories throughout Scripture. The Scriptures describe... Uh, how we have this unity when we sing together. That we are engaging with the truth of God and that we are transformed by it. A.W. Tozer has a, a really a beautiful analogy of how this would come to be. He wrote, Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They've never once been in each other's company but they are one accord, they are unified by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard, which every single one of those pianos or individuals for us must bow to and say, this is the standard. So when a hundred worshipers meet together, each one looking towards Christ, are, their hearts are gathered nearer to each other than they could possibly be because they were becoming unified through, through consciousness and turning their eyes uh, away from themselves but towards God to strive for His likeness. One of the art exhibits that I would really like to uh, curate for you is uh, the words that S.M. Lockridge, an amazing American pastor, uh, that he had pulled out of Scripture. Listen to this picture. Jesus. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. I hope you can hear the, the rhythm in this. He's God's Son. He's a sinner Savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He stands alone in Himself. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's supreme. He's preeminent. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest idea in philosophy. He is the fundamental truth in theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers captives and he defends the feeble and he blesses. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent. He beautifies the meek. Do you know him? Well, my king is the king of knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of legislators. Man, don't we need to hear that? He's the overseer of overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. His life is matchless. 
His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting and His love never changes. His word is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Well, I wish I could describe Him to you, but He's indescribable. Yes, He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you that the heavens cannot contain Him, let alone a man explain Him. You can't get Him out of your mind. You can't get Him off of your hands. You can't live without Him. And you can't live, outlive Him. The Pharisees couldn't stand up to Him, but they found out they couldn't stop Him. Pilate couldn't find any fault with Him. Herod couldn't kill Him. Death could not handle Him. And the grave couldn't hold Him. I'm talking about He who had no predecessor, he who has no successor. There was nobody before him. There'll be nobody after him. And you can't impeach him. He's not going to resign. We try to get prestige and honor and glory to ourselves. But the glory is all his. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. How long is that? And ever and ever and ever and ever. And when you get through with all of the forevers, then, amen. Oh, I wish I could describe him to you. Nothing is like him. I searched the world, but it couldn't fail me. And man's empty praise and treasure. came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's Turn.